Good morning. Welcome to Pasadena Presbyterian Church's English language service. We're so glad that you've joined us in person or online via YouTube or Facebook or the Arroyo channel. However you join us, know that you are welcome here. If you are visiting us for the first time, please fill out a visitor card, drop it in the box as you leave, and stop by our visitor table in the courtyard so that we can get to know you a little bit better and you can get to know a little bit more about us. We are looking uh, for regular members to be greeters. So if you or your family would like to greet on a regular basis, please see me after the service. We'll sign you up for a Sunday so that you can welcome people as they enter the church. It's a great opportunity to spend time and get to know people in the congregation and to get to know some of our newcomers. This month, we are also collecting pledge cards. It's a second uh, spring pledge drive for us rather than the fall just the fall pledge drive. And this is uh, to help us plan the budget, not just for this year, but for upcoming years and allows us to continue to support uh, the, the ministry for food to the insecure, food insecure, to provide outstanding Friends of Music programs, stream worship, and invite uh, experts to share about issues that affect us today during our adult education hour. And for example, today we are hosting Joe Roos and Randy Henlam, who are here today to speak during the Adult Education Hour on conflicts in Palestine and Israel. Everyone's invited to join the conversation in Gamble Lounge following the coffee hour. And finally, next Sunday, we will be holding a combined worship service with our guest preacher, the co-moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA, the Reverend Ruth Santana Grace. She will be following that service with an opportunity for you to ask questions about relevant issues in the PCUSA and what the PCUSA is doing now. I invite you now to stand as you are able to join me in the call to worship. We gather with joy for Christ's saving death and resurrection brings new life. The risen Christ is with us wherever we go. Love breaks all bonds and unites us in hope. Christ has defeated death. Let us rejoice and be glad. Come worship with hearts full of praise. O oh God, receive our grateful hallelujahs.
Please be seated. Let the life, teaching, and resurrection of the risen Christ lift and instruct our hearts this day, that we may greet a new week as an occasion to discover him in our midst, making all things new in the springtime of your Holy Spirit. As we turn ourselves toward God and seek to follow, let us confess our sin together. God, our Redeemer, in raising Jesus from the dead, you showed us your power to defeat all that brings fear and sorrow to our lives. Yet we confess we are sometimes uncertain if we can trust the promise of resurrection for ourselves, not only in life beyond death, but also to bring new life into our current states. Forgive us when we struggle to trust your goodness for us. Forgive us when we miss the signs of your love all around us. Let us continue our prayer in silence. Amen. Scripture teaches that there is a time for every matter under heaven, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. In confessing our sins to God, we have offered God our tears of regret and pain. Now is the time to rejoice in God's mercy. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we can make a new start. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able. God has given us peace through Christ, so let us pass the peace of, peace of Christ to each other. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
The scripture, re the scripture lesson for today comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. <clears throat> Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the kids up to be with me. Come on up. Hi. Come join us. Today, one, one of the things I'm going to be talking about with the adults is um, kind of like a game that we sometimes play with as kids. Um, have you ever played Whisper Down the Lane? Do you know that game? Whisper Down the Lane is, do you know how to use your whisper voice? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how to use a whisper voice? Yeah. Yeah. When you're real quiet. Well, sometimes there's a game where you whisper something to someone and then they have to whisper what they heard to the next person and then that person has to whisper what they heard to the next person and it goes around the group. And what's funny about the game is sometimes we mishear and then we tell someone something and the, when we get to the end and we say, what did you hear? Sometimes it is so different than what the first person said, and sometimes it gets really silly. But sometimes that happens in, in real life, too, not just when we're playing games, and where we'll tell someone something and they maybe didn't hear it completely right, or um, maybe sometimes that happens with our moms and dads where they tell us something and we think we heard them, and then they get upset or they say, you weren't listening to me. Um, sometimes we miss each other, right? We miss what we're trying to say. And so we have to listen really carefully and make sure that we share what was intended, right? So I'm gonna pray for us as we keep learning how to listen to God, okay? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your life. Thank you for your life given for us. And we thank you for continuing to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to what you intend for us, teaching us how to love ourselves and to love others as we love ourselves. In your name, amen. All right, you can go back to your seats.
Lisa introduced last week, we are doing a series on the I am statements of Jesus. Today we are focusing on Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. In our current Bible, Jesus says this in response to Martha, one of his close friends and disciples, and we will read about that in a moment. Yet there are several problems in this chapter that we're going to read. And I heard that one of our Bible studies this week ran into some of those problems. So if you have felt at times when you've read chapter um, 11 of John, of the Gospel of John, that it's somewhat convoluted, you are not alone. In fact, um, scholars today now see that how there are several verses that seem to have been added in uh, after the first manuscript was originally written, particularly around the verses of Martha. So scholars today are wrestling, wondering why would someone feel so strongly sometime in the first or second century to correct the original gospel? For example, why would it be so important to add in a whole section where Jesus says directly to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. What's going on here? Martha is spoken of one other time in Luke's gospel. She's the one in the kitchen that some of you may remember or have heard about, concerned with the daily chores rather than spending time with Jesus. So why duplicate her presence in our passage for today, after the gospel has already been written and which seems to only cause more problems in reading the chapter? A few years ago, Elizabeth Schrader Pulzer, a doctoral student at the time at Duke University, asked this very question. She noted numerous editorial markings in early manuscripts and highlighted how many other scholars had also raised this question about why Martha appears to be added in to John's gospel. Schrader Pulzer finally suggested that Mary, not Martha, described in this chapter may actually have been Mary Magdalene and that editors in the Bible over the years had sought to minimize John's emphasis on Mary Magdalene by making it seem like she was Martha's sister and not only Lazarus' sister. It would be too much for us to cover all of that in detail today, but I wanted you to be aware of the significant questions surrounding this passage, to have it in the background for yourselves and to know that if you're interested in learning more, you can and it is worth exploring. But for now, please hear the word of God found in John's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. The village of Mary, editorial note, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So, editorial mark, the sisters went, sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness is not will not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved, editorial mark, Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea now. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk in night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I am going there to awaken him. 
The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to, editorial marks, Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When, editorial marks for this whole paragraph, Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. End of all those editorial marks. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone, editorial marks. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. That's a long passage for this morning. And all of those editorial marks. Interesting, yes? What do we make of that? 
As North American disciples of Christ, it is important for us to keep in mind regularly that the Bible was not originally written in English, and it had early scribes copying original manuscripts, sometimes making some errors and sometimes adding in edits. We are doing the best we can today to understand what was originally said. And there's a bit of whisper down the lane going on, as I mentioned in the children's time. And this has been going on for 2,000 years, which is why it is important for us to keep going back to those original sayings as best we can for ourselves, to keep reading our Bibles and exploring what has been going on from the start. And you don't need a bunch of degrees to do it, especially today. There are some great websites, for instance, like BibleGateway.com and BibleHub.com, which can help any reader to look over the various ways that interpretations have gone and what people have said over the years. For now, in our passage today, we have a deep theological statement from Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. In a section of the Bible that appears to have been added in. So what happens when we step back for a moment and look at what's around the edges of those marks? We've got the disciples who are super worried about Jesus going back to Bethany near Jerusalem They don't want him risking his life after nearly being stoned. And we've got Thomas. Thomas, who has famously been known as Doubting Thomas, because after the resurrection, he insists on placing his hands on Jesus' wounds before he can trust that Jesus actually is risen from the dead. Here, Thomas is speaking up, which is rare, And he's saying, let's, all of us disciples, go and die with him. You might wonder if he is saying, let's go die with Lazarus. More likely, though, since Jesus has just said that Lazarus is going to live, Thomas is aligning himself with Jesus and saying, I fully get that Jesus is walking into a hornet's nest right now. And he says to the disciples that we should go there boldly with him. So when we take Martha's words out, Thomas's words become clear words of aligning with Christ. Everyone else in the passage, all the other disciples are backing away from how treacherous things are getting maybe even Mary especially. So here's what scholars are wondering. What if Mary Magdalene is the Mary in this passage? What if she is Lazarus's sister? It certainly enhances our understandings of the grief she may have been feeling at the cross and when she goes into the garden on Easter morning. We know for sure this Mary is the one who anoints Jesus with oil. And this Mary in this passage seems to be betraying Jesus. She's blind and determined in her grief. And even though in the past he has been telling people, don't tell people who I am and what I am doing, she calls him out in front of everyone. Use your power, Jesus out yourself. Why are you leaving me alone and desperate in my grief? Give me the thing I want. I want my brother, and I know you can give him to me. We know that grief, don't we? We know that kind of anger. We know that pain and that heartache that sense of injustice. Come on, Jesus, just give me what I want. I want a good thing. I want my brother with me. Grief can make us 
pretty self-focused, can it? Our pain is not wrong, but what we do with our pain at times can become self-absorbed. We can miss what's going on around us. We can really hurt others when we are nearly entirely absorbed in our own grief and we feel like no one cares. Our passage says, in response, Jesus had very mixed emotions in this moment, including some anger, which sometimes doesn't come out in our English, but was there in the Greek. Yet here, in the midst of these complex, intense feelings, Jesus does not retaliate. He doesn't run away either. Even as he is hurt and angry, he stays with Mary in her grief and has room for it. And then he says about Lazarus, Unbind him and let him go. Why does Jesus say, let him go? If you unbind someone, aren't you letting them go? Why the double emphasis? I think Jesus is talking to the hearts of those around him, to Mary's heart and even to our hearts. Let him go. Let the person you are clinging to go. We are not meant to cling to each other. We are meant to let each other go into life. Not to hang on to people or to control each other. We are meant to love each other freely. And it is hard. It is not easy to let our loved ones be independent or to encourage their own senses of being and calling. As you consider what it might mean to not cling to the people in your life, remember, the resurrection is not just about not dying. It's not just about going to heaven. It's about thriving. It's about spiritual freedom. It's about life and living. As I come to a close, I want to leave us with this. The disciple that we often today refer to as Doubting Thomas seems to be the disciple in this passage who actually may have gotten this sense of resurrection and life the most. Because here's an interesting thing about Thomas, if you don't know it already. Right after Jesus' resurrection, Thomas leaves Jerusalem. He goes and he follows the famous Silk Road, the main trading route of that time. He goes reportedly into India, and eventually to China. He plants churches all along the way. In fact, there are direct descendants to this day who claim to be part of the families and households that Thomas originally shared the good news with, who are still involved in some of those churches or have gone out on their own In fact, one of those descendants was a part of one of my churches growing up here in the States. He and his family had come from India to be missionaries in the United States. Can you imagine being a part of a family that could say our ancestors were some of the ones that the disciple Thomas first preached to? But that's the thing, right? This experience happened to this group of people, and it fundamentally changed their understanding of life, of the life. 
they started telling people around them about this incredible experience. And those people told other people and so on over 2,000 years from household to household, from church to church, this incredible news traveled along such a fragile way from person to person, all the way to today. And now it's your turn. Amen. And let us join together in affirming our faith with song. Please stand if you are able. Please be seated. Let us pray for all the earth, the church, and all those in need, saying, in the name of Christ our risen Lord, hear our prayer. God our maker, source of resurrection, power, and hope, you have walked with your faithful people through many generations, people facing challenge and uncertainty, people seeking your purpose and promise. We still face challenges and uncertainty, even with your resurrection in our hearts. Walk with us and with those for whom we pray for this day, so that your resurrecting power may lead us in lives of faithfulness. In the name of Christ our risen Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for children and young people, who must think about the future in uncertain times, facing threats old and new. Give them hope rooted in the knowledge that their lives matter to you. Show them how to make a difference in the world, whatever threats they face as they grow. In the name of Christ our risen Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for people for whom age or experience illness or disability create barriers to full participation in your world. Surround each one in pain or despair with your comfort and renew in each one a sense of dignity and purpose. Show them how much they matter to you and to us. In the name of Christ our risen Lord, hear our prayer. 
We pray for all those facing grief and any kind of loss. Give them strength and comfort. We pray for communities challenged by forces beyond their control, natural disaster and environmental threats, conflict and violence, or economic hardship. Give courage to those facing these challenges and wisdom to those who lead so that well-being may be restored and hope for the future prevail. In the name of Christ, our risen Lord, hear our prayer. As signs of spring emerge, we pray for your creation. Jesus, you are the firstborn of all creation. Help us to honor you by caring for the earth and its fragile balances in the ways we live and the priorities we set. In these ways, too, we would be your disciples. And so we pray the words you taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our lives overflow with blessing and goodness from Christ and in creation. Out of the bounty with which God has blessed us, let us present to God our offerings with gratitude. You are invited to leave money in the offering box in the back of the chapel, donate online, or let us know how you would like to give of your time and talent. Thank you. Please join me as we pray to dedicate this offering. God, our maker, you have filled the world with so much abundance. We offer our gifts to you, knowing they are part of your abundance. Bless them and use them to bring hope and new life in Christ's name to a world that so badly needs these gifts. Amen.
May you feel yourselves unbound and let go. Let go to share the good news of not only the resurrection, but the life. And know that as you go, you do not go alone. You go with the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and wise counsel of the Holy Spirit. Amen.